We're going to discuss number eight in the ten concepts of the therapeutic community. And number eight is described as understanding the function of a belief system in the TC. A belief system. Charles, would you explain to us what that is? Well, in, in, in life we have what we call, in particular the therapeutic community, we have what we call written and unwritten rules. The written rules are very obvious, but then there is unwritten rules, and unwritten rules deals with the common sense and courtesy. It's based on the culture and the understanding of the belief system as a whole in the therapeutic community. For instance, in the gangs, for instance, uh, we talked about uh, structure, order, and discipline. Well, discipline is predicated on rules and regulations. And so with the rules and the, and the gangs, they have this understanding that uh, this is written and we know what they are. But then there is some unwritten rules uh, that uh, that's not written down, but people should know these rules and they're basically predicated on the rules that are in uh, the uh, therapeutic community rule book. But what we all know about rules is simply this, is that rules in itself does not change people. There's no power in telling you not to do something to change yourself. The rules has to be kind of tampered with the love and making people aware. So what we do is that we try to have these written and unwritten rules, the belief system, but the belief system is always predicated on holding one accountable, but we're doing it in such a way that it's keeping people, uh, or making them aware of their mistakes and actually doing something. When, you, when a person violates a rule, we don't punish that person. We associate whatever consequences that we give them with the rule to try to help them overcome and uh, understand that this is not the right thing to do. We tell them the why, uh, per se. Karen, you've often mentioned we have to explain to them the why, just as Charles has just mentioned. What do you mean by that? Are you trying to reach them a little deeper level than just rules? Yeah, I think when we're talking about the belief system, it's, we, go be, we go to that level because what we're asking them is to trust. So they have to believe in the rules. They're not just practicing the rules. They're practicing because. They're going to grow from those rules, and the person next to them is going to grow from those rules. There's a lesson learned in every single one of the rules in the, in the community. Their belief system before they came in a lot of times was kind of like a don't talk, don't tell kind of thing, don't snitch. So now we're asking them to do something very different, and with that we need them to take a chance. And they have to trust us in order to be able to do that. That's a big step for them. So in some sense, uh, common sense and courtesy is related to trust. Well, common sense and courtesy is like, for instance, there's no rule to say that you shouldn't spit on the sidewalk. But as a result of the rule that self-respect and those type of rules that the belief system is, should be an automatic function of the individual that is involved in the group. There's a lot of rules in life that is not written down on paper but it's an understanding. Once you have this, what we call a paradigm shift, where a person stops thinking the way they've been thinking and change the way they're thinking, well, there's a certain amount of written rules and a certain amount of unwritten rules will accompany that type of thinking, that new way of thinking. And so once a person stops that, what we, the other thing is that we're talking about is that if a person brings their body, their mind will soon show up and that was in the af acting as if. Uh, we talked about that early on. Some of these rules is that maybe our person or their client does not agree with, but they abide by these rules, and as they violate these rules, which they will, we confront them and they hold them accountable to doing the right thing. And once you hold somebody accountable, you don't do what the institution would do. They would punish you if you violate the rules. What we do is that we would hold you accountable by giving you consequences to address the infraction that was committed. So the person now, uh, say for instance, if a person was uh, involved in, in just uh, horse playing. So we would address the horse playing by allowing that person 
to talk to other clients and other inmates who have had that same problem and write a seminar to address that specific behavior. And so we address the behavior. Uh, we don't just give the person, maybe in an institution setting, they would lock you up or give you extra duty, uh, extra things to do, a uh, certain amount of days in lockup. What we do is that we try to address the issue at hand, the problem that's being violated. One of the fundamental, I guess, bedrock values of the Bridges of America belief system is that you believe a person can change. Um, I'm sure it's important for the inmate to believe he or she can change. How do you convey that concept to them, Karen? What? Or oh, Charles? Either? Well, that's a good that's a good point because when you're talking about the belief system and believing a man can change, many of our clients, our inmates, they don't believe that they can change. They have no hope. They feel hopeless. And I mentioned just the other day that hope deferred makes the heart sick. So you have a person that has this hopelessness about themselves, and so you're instilling hope. What I call that is, uh, what we call that is um, a person expectation. If I expect you to do better than you're doing, then of course you would take on my persona about how I feel about your capable capability of doing better than you're doing, and that would eventually instill some confidence in you and your belief system would begin to change about who you are as a person. The first belief that we have to change in the belief system is that person has to believe that they can change, not just us believing that they can change. Somehow or another, we have to convey that to them and they would have to believe that there's possibility for change. They have to believe, first, they have a problem. Secondly, they have to believe that somebody can help them with that problem. And the third thing is that they must believe that you and them working together can help resolve these issues that they are facing every day and that they need to change in their life. I'm glad that you said that, Charlie, because that was, that was where I was going to go with that answer. Because it, we have to convey that to the clients, the staff. You know, we have to have that attitude. That's, that comes from our attitude, from our spirit. And that shows. That shows as soon as we walk out into the community. It shows every time we have a conversation with any single one of the inmates. You know, what we're doing is we're encouraging them. You know, people ask us why our programs are different from a client being incarcerated. And they're different because it works. Because what we do happens because we believe in it. And when we believe in it, that's conveyed to every client, every inmate that we speak to. And once they get it, then they, they're conveying that automatically within the community. They're doing things that are completely different from what they would have ever done before. So the new guys that are coming in are looking at this and they're saying, you know what, maybe I'll try it just because, because I believe it will work. You know, the typical citizen or taxpayer has this concept that when we send someone off to a, a correctional institution that they're going to actually get corrected. But we know that generally the attitude there is that they don't believe a person can change and are not really that interested in changing. So you have quite a bit to overcome in this inmate or this client's uh, activities and behaviors when they come to you. What kind of confrontations does that result in? Well, as a, uh, let me give you a perfect example of that, Larry. As a pastor, I, also, I believe in the Ten Commandments, but as you know, the Ten Commandments of the raw laws of the, of, the, of the Bible cannot change anybody. What changes people is the love. And I think oh, if you look at one of the scriptures where Jesus was asked this question, what was the greatest commandment? And uh, he, he said that you can hang all of the commandments on these two things, love the Lord and love each other. And so as we confront one another, well, the difference is, is that what our confrontation has, is, has to be mixed with love. We have to believe that the person can change, but also we, we, we deal with the issue at hand. We tell them why that's not a good thing to do, but we tell them how they can change, which make the biggest, which is make a much big difference, a bigger difference in the lives of the person. They know why and they know how. I often tell people that counselors in general, 
that we are not here to teach them what to think. We're here to teach them how to think. And this difference in uh, a person, if you have to teach a person what to think, you have to be there on every scenario, every situation that they face, you have to give them and tell them what to think and how to change that behavior. But if you teach them how to think with love, it posture them in a position where they can not only learn to change in their own life, but they will be able to take this to their fellow peer or to even in their families or in their own environment and change would be more a permanent change instead of just a temporary change based on fear. And so as their belief system change, as you expect their relationships and their activities outside of our program to change significantly too, is that right? Well, when we teach them how to think, what we're doing is we're telling them to go out to the community and ask their peers what they need to be doing to change whatever it is that we're addressing with them. You know, Charlie, so many times we've disciplined some of the clients, the inmates, and the expectation from the client would be that they were going to get discharged. And when we kind of put something else in place and came up with another plan, they just didn't expect that. You know, they just were really shocked that somebody would care enough not to just toss them aside because that's what they're used to. So the message is, we believe in you. You know, we believe you can do better. You're making a mistake here, and we need to correct this. This is not something that, you know, we're just going to us under the rug, you know, we really want to work with you here. So that kind of goes inside a person, you know, and that's what it's all about. And this is not just about rules and regulations. This is about a paradigm shift, changing the way a person thinks about life in general. I give you, I have so many examples, but one perfect example is that, for instance, uh, we have in phase two where clients, in order to go to phase three, they have to present a petition to us. And so in the beginning, they started out writing these petitions handwritten, and I have to strain my eyes to try to figure out what was, because when a clinical was taken very serious, that we had to understand a lot more about the client, whether they really caught on to what we've been teaching them all of this time. And so they tell us about who they are and how the connection between who they used to be has changed them up to this point. So they was bringing in these handwritten petitions and I made an announcement to the counseling staff is that I wanted every petition to be typed from this moment on because I was tired of just receiving these uh, handwritten petitions. And my counselors came up with every idea why they couldn't do that. So at first I realized that I had to change the belief system of the staff first before I implemented this in the community. So I told this, the staff not to mention this tell the clients that they can't do it. I say, what I want to do is that tell them that's what I want done. And let's listen to them and get any feedback from them and they'll tell me why they can't do it or they can't do it. So we, we presented the idea to uh, the, the, the clients. The clients came up and they was excited about it because they wanted to do it. But then they had some ideas. They said, well, where would we get a computer, a typewriter to type it up? And I had provided a typewriter for the community to, uh, of, of computer, a word processor at the time. And they was able to have these up. And some people, they presented another question to me and said, well, what about the people that can't use or can't type? I said, well, that's what this community is all about. Find somebody they can that can help you with this process. And to make a long story short is that even now, Karen, is that one of the mandates of a second or third phase petition is that they must be typed up. Right. And so, and, and then another thing happened as a result of that, they was coming in dressed uh, from work or they didn't take it serious enough as far as I was concerned. And so I made another rule. I said, I want all you guys, I want to tell the clients before they can come into my office to do a clinical, I want them to look their very best. I want them to put on their Sunday best suit however they look when they are dressed at their very best. And then again, the staff came up with other re all the reasons why that couldn't happen. And so I said that, why can't it happen? And so we went back and forth. And so I finally convinced the staff first, because in generally, that's what you have to do, convince the staff that the client can do, uh, they are willing to do whatever new thing or new beliefs that you want to implement in the community. 
So I convinced the staff. The staff presented it to the, the, the clients and the inmates. Now, presentation is always important, how you present something. If you present it in such a way to indicate that it's not a possibility that you're going to be able to do this, but we just want you to do it anyway, they won't do it. But if you present it in such a way to get them excited and motivated about the idea, then they would do it. So that's how our belief system is. We have to get them excited about this new way of thinking, the new way of believing about who they are as a person, and that they can indeed change.